you know, the, there's a very famous dictum associated with your work. I mean, the, the famous modernist phrase is form follows function. And you revise this, and I think rather elegantly, with the term form accommodates function. And the image you use, or the contrast that you use, is between the glove, form follows function, something that fits very tightly, to, to the mitten. I happen to like mittens myself. So tell us a little bit about this idea and, and what you mean when you talk in terms of form accommodating function. And I guess that dates back to your earliest work. I think it's one way to explain where we stand, where modernism, uh, one of the main phrases of modernism was um, uh, you design from the inside out. Yeah. Uh, Le Corbusier said that, and Frank Lloyd Wright said that. Both of them said it. They were two leaders, but both kind of aesthetic enemies, yeah. but two leaders in modernism. But ironically, they both said that. Yeah. And what we like to say is context is important, and you, and you design from the outside in as well in the same building as the inside out. But the inside out, of course, connects very much with the idea of functionalism, that you, you, you make the building connect very much with the immediate function. And we like to say, involving complexity and contradiction, that functions are constantly changing within a building. Before you design, before you finish designing it, usually the program has changed to some extent. And there is a long tradition of wonderful buildings that um, are loft buildings. The Italian Palazzo is one. The building we're in, the beautiful building we're in at Dexel is one. Uh, the industrial loft is one. As I said, the Italian Palazzo is one. Uh, academic buildings are one where the buildings can can accommodate change over time, and where in the mitten uh, things the, the fingers can grow can room, grow differently, so yeah. and that connects us again to architecture, which is based not which then is not based on being articulated form. Uh, ah, the uh, it's interesting form, uh, but because that form is going to be changing inside. Uh, but it is um, the loft building where the form is not, quote, interesting. What's interesting is the surfaces of the building, the, 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 the often ornamental surfaces. And that's very anti-modern architecture because yeah. it's saying, ah, let's engage signage, let's engage symbols, and let's engage ornament. All, you can combine all those words into iconography. And that, of course, we learned very much from learning from Las Vegas. Yeah, I wanted to talk, I'd like you to talk a little bit about that very seminal book, Learning from Las Vegas. And it, it is such a groundbreaking, such a shocking book in a way. Even now, I think, the idea that the iconography of Las Vegas that we tend to dismiss as so commercial and in some cases so ugly, you saw with new eyes. and. Uh, understood differently. Could you talk a little bit about the philosophy behind that? that One book? of the basic aspects of the philosophy was the whole notion of um, looking at what is and trying to look with sympathy rather than viewing with alarm. And um, one, among other things, we felt you have much more fun in life if everything you see isn't <laughs> horrifying. That's so true. <laughs> Bob, used to, Bob yeah. and I used to play a game which said, I can like something worse than you can like. <laughs> but that was very liberating, yeah. to shock yourselves into a new awareness. Uh -huh. And that came a lot from my training in England and then from the social planners. And they said things like this, um, People are very bored by the spaces architects make. And why don't you architects go somewhere where people vote with their feet? Mm -hmm. People go there. Yeah. See why they go there. Yeah. So when I moved from teaching at Penn to teaching at Berkeley, I partly went to look at the cities of the Southwest, the automobile cities and how they operated. And I stopped off on the way. I made six stops along the way. And one of the stops was Las Vegas, which I'd known about, I'd seen. And, yeah. um, so, and I was intrigued and entranced. And then when we were starting a new school at UCLA, and I had a good visitor's budget, and I asked my various colleagues to come and lecture to my students. So I asked Bob to come, and we gave the students a sketch design, and I took him to Las Vegas because I knew he ought to see 
Las Vegas. And did he react the way you oh, did? Oh, yes. Yeah, and it was the time of Tom Wolfe, so we'd been reading about the candy-colored streamland, uh -huh. tangerine, whatever it was called. But it's important when yes. we're talking about Las Vegas, it is important to note that it's yes. the Las Vegas of then, which was involved the urbanism uh, of the strip. Yes. And it's not the Las Vegas of today, which is Disneyland and scenographic. So we must emphasize that it's the long of the Do past. You feel and we were loving what we were doing was studying in general yeah. the uh, urbanism of the automobile urbanism, which again modern architects didn't look at or like very much. Mm -hmm. So we loved Los Angeles, which was again ho horrifying to people. But we went to Las Vegas as sort of a smaller, simpler version of Los uh, Angeles. Yeah, you right. could say this that um, in Las Vegas, the signs which are 12 feet high on a normal strip are 22 stories high. Yeah. And in New Jersey, it's overlaid on several other patterns, maybe going back some hundreds of years even. Yeah. And in Las Vegas, the strip, strip was in the desert. Yeah. So it was a very pure form. It wasn't a prototype, it was an archetype. And you could see it yes. plain, yes. so to speak. Now, did you get a lot of flack for this, I mean, this, I would imagine since our architects tend to be, uh, am I wrong to say, an effete group in some ways, um, that they, the initial re reaction might have been extremely resistant. Well, it's already started with complexity and contradiction. Yeah, and they were, there was and opposition And we've just to that. come back from lecturing at Delft in Holland, and there was a thousand students came to this lecture. It was very moving. And then they still had... TV, closed circuit TV outside of that. And um, some of the students said to us, you know, even as late as three years ago, we couldn't have invited you because of the sentiment. Really? Against the you. Yeah. In the faculty. Uh -huh. So it's taken. But that it's still, long. Yeah. that was, you know, we were outrageous then. Mm -hmm. Now we are boring. 